Hi, everyone. I'm Heather Brown, um, as Tom uh, introduced me. And Paige and I are both with um, the Virginia Community College System. Um, and I'm with Tidewater Community College. I've been in higher education for over 30 years now. And I find AI just uh, a very exciting time right now. So um, let's go forward. Our, our title for our presentation today is Chat GPT and AI, and where are we now? Um, go ahead, Paige. All right. Good afternoon. Um, here's some figures that uh, we thought we would add to the presentation just so that everybody is kind of aware where the AI market is and how it is expected to grow um, over the next not so many years. Um, also, if you have your cellular device cell phone, please go ahead and grab it. Um, I can't stand webinars where um, everybody is just a talking head. So we're gonna play a little Slido. If you haven't done Slido before, you can use your camera on your phone to uh, go ahead and scan the QR code. Or you can go to your browser on your phone, either Safari, Chrome, whatever your flavor is, and type in slido.com and type in the code 23919925. And so our first question, um, I'm that's going to be repeated. If you didn't quite get there, it's going to be on every interactive slide. So if you um, didn't get this one, then just hold still because there it is again on the left-hand side. So go ahead and let us know how frequently you are using AI in your daily life. And the ratings go from not at all to every day, all day. Um, I, I am best friends with all of the AI overlords. That's the big running joke on my campus um, is that it's if you need anything AI, just ask Paige. So um, I play with all different kinds of AI. And as you can see, um, this is a very good representation of, uh, and again, I'm way over there on the far, far right. Um, and so that's kind of where I am. But I did want to to, to just kind of see where everybody was and if you were using it. And I think um, a lot of people don't even realize how much it's being used or when you're using it. If you're talking to Siri, you're using AI. Okay, so how do you feel about generative AI and its potential impact to on your college? So again, uh, feel free to answer. Uh, and if you don't want to answer, that's fine. But I really like uh, Slido because it shows you as things are going in. It also shows you at the top how many people are participating. So we have about 120, oh, 41 people now that are participating. So um, somewhere in between, I hope this discussion provides clarity. We hope so too. Um, so, you know, that's our, that's our goal today anyway. And one more for now. I guess that was the last one. Oh, wait. Okay. So um, this is our agenda for today. We're going to talk to you about what is AI, AI models, what they are, the importance, functions, the next big thing, which nobody knows the answer to, right? Um, here comes Skynet. That, no, just tease it. <laughs> and then uh, our conclusion and resources. So let's begin at the beginning. So AI, what is it? Uh, by the way, a lot of these images that you are going to see in our presentation, um, I made using an AI called Midjourney. Um, if you want to know more about that, feel free to ask me. Um, so this is Merriam-Webster's definition of AI. Um, I will give credit where credit is due. So again, it's, it is computer software. Um, and again, what you put in is a lot of what you get out. And the synth synthesis, I can say that, um, of what is uh, going on really kind of helps to figure out um, what your AI is going to do. Now, everybody knows a lot about AI, but um, Heather is going to talk to you now about ChatGPT. Heather, you're on mute. Okay, here we go, one more time. ChatGPT is a natural language generative AI. It's pre-trained by recognizing patterns and relationships between words in a large data set from the internet. 
and it relies on a combination of unsupervised pre-training and then supervised fine tuning. It uses machine learning to transform data sets into a large language model. And this is, this is called a neural network. Um, it generates responses based on patterns it recognizes in the user's input, which we would call a prompt. I like, I think of chat GPT uh, like a text predictor on steroids. Um, so we want to go next, my slides are not, uh, yeah, thank you, Paige. ChatGPT is revolutionizing the way we learn and interact with materials. So I want to take a look at some foundational models out there, but, but before we do that, um, what AI models have you all heard of? And I think you can enter, text it in and type it in, right? Yeah. Anyone? <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, so chat GPT, Bard, Bing, Adobe Firefly, right? How cool is that? <laughs> right, Google Poe. I just read about Poe the other day. I had never heard of it. Um, Sakura, I haven't heard of that. Minor. I love these because there are so many, there's so many out there now. So um, it really gives a really great perspective. Thank you for filling that out. Um, so the, this, we're going to talk today about six main large language models that are out there. First, um, the free version, ChatGPT 3.5. It's free. It's fast. It came out. It's one, well, three came out in November of 2022. There's now a 3.5. Um, it's pretty solid at writing and coding. Um, not still not very good at doing math. It's getting better. Um, it currently is not connected to the internet, but um, news has it that it is going to have a Bing plugin available um, for free. Eventually, it is, hasn't ha happened yet. Um, then there is Chat GPT four, and this chatbot. This one is. Um, it is the paid version. It's $20 a month. And it is, does have a Bing AI plugin. It um, is the most advanced system that's out there right now. Um, it's producing safer and more useful responses based on the feedback from ChatGPT 3 and 3.5. And then there's Bing AI. It is connected to the internet. Um, and Bing has three modes. It has a creative, uh, uh, precise, and balanced. And the creative mode in the Bing AI chat is connected to chat GPT-4. So it is, and it's free. So you don't have to pay for the open AI chat GPT-4. You can go to Bing in creative mode and use it. Um, and then there's Anthropic Claude. I haven't personally used Claude, um, but it supports a lot of words. So I think it's about 75,000 um, words, which means you can paste a large amount of content into Claude, where the other, the chat, GPT-4 and Bing, you're limited um, and so Claude's really good at large, large amounts of text. Um, and it's really good for summarizing that. And then there's um, Google Bard, which is still lagging behind ChatGPT and Bing, but it's slowly making its strides. I see it uh, like silently kind of maneuvering between the, the two bigger ones right now that, that most people know about. Um, I've used it. I like it. Um, and it has a Google it button associated with it too. So when it gives you its generated output from your prompt, you can also hit the Google button and it'll, it'll go out and search for additional information and citations and, 
and um, URLs that you can further research whatever it is that you're um, asking um, for Google Bard to um, provide for you. Um, the, the big thing that's happened is that ChatGPT is a plugin now, and also in OpenAI, ChatGPT4 has a plugin um, store as well. And plugins and extensions are software add-ons that are instilled on a program, enhancing, enhancing its capabilities or providing additional functions, which is really a game changer. Um, and like I mentioned, ChatGPT4 has a plugin store, um, and there's all sorts of plugins that you can choose from, Kayak, um, Expedia, there's just, I'm just naming two travel ones because I've been on there recently. I'm looking at a trip. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, um, you know, there's a download, there's even a downloadable, downloadable uh, chat GPT app for Apple, um, for your phone. I've got Bing AI on my cellular phone um, and it's a droid. I have a droid. And then, um, ChatGPT, it's out for Apple, but it's not out for Droid yet, but it's coming. And, you know, just these are the six large language models. And, and there are at least five that I saw on that um, Slido that we just did. There's also, there's Perplexity. There's um, Poe. Um, there's Forefront. Um, Merlin, and these are all free. Um, I haven't played with Perplexity. I've heard about it. Um, Poe, Forefront, and Merlin, I've not heard of. I heard of Poe the other day, but the other ones I haven't. So you can imagine now with, with these chat GBT plugins or these plugins that are out there, you know, it, they're there are so many ways that you can use this AI chatbot. And so that kind of leads into the next question that we want to ask is, you have, do you have any idea, um, you know, how many tools were released just in March? We're going back to March alone. Um, it's quite a staggering number. <laughs> just a hint, hint. Yes, it was more than a thousand. Um, and so we wanted to kind of put this in here just to, to, to throw a little perspective on how quickly things are changing. Um, and yes, more than a thousand tools were released in one month. Um, and that was a statistic that I found um, from a newsletter uh, called Superhuman, um, which uh, Heather and I both subscribe to. So now I'm going to um, take a little time here and talk to you about the importance of AI. So we're all here um, as many different roles in a college. So I really thought that I needed to kind of summarize the best parts of AI and kind of put it together in a way that you could see which how each function at a college could use AI. Again, this is about working smarter, not harder. So thinking about um, institutional tasks, it does data assessment. Um, I found um, an AI today that actually will analyze all of your data in a spreadsheet. Um, it can do performance assessments. It can be do administrative support. For students, um, it can do personalized learning, um, which we all know is something that all students need, um, but it's difficult and it requires a lot of work on the um, instructor. However, using an AI, you can make your life and your student's life a lot easier and very, very much personalized. It can provide adaptive feedback based on the responses that students give as far as student support. It can help with academic advising, career advice. It can resolve accessibility issues, instructional tasks. Um, all of us, um, I, I am an adjunct and anything I can do to, to make the mundane tasks like 
automated assessment grading. That's going to be helpful to me. Practice opportunities where students can practice something before they can put the information into ChatGPT, ask it to create their own quiz just for them based on the information, and they can use it as a study guide. Um, they, it can generate content that you're looking for. Um, you can take a whole bunch of articles, um, as Heather said, put it in, ask it to summarize, use that um, in your courses, feedback and transcription. Educational research, again, talks about sifting through large data sets and builds models. And learning support is chatbots and learning to flag at-risk students. So all of those things that you see there are really, um, can be tied to any department and how much it could really help you work a lot smarter um, and give you the information that you want in much faster way. So what are the functions of AI? So let's talk about some benefits and some limitations. Um, um, we read the questions that you all sent in and we really appreciate those and thank you very much. And we hope that we cover a lot of them today, And but in 30 minutes, that's going to be hard. And I talk fast anyway, but I can't really talk fast enough to cover all those questions. So um, benefits. Thinking about, again, back to the personalized learning, um, also being able to provide students with that 24-7 um, support or faculty where you don't have to have that human available and paying. And, you know, and as things are getting smarter and working faster, um, it's going to really automate and really help the fact that students can get that support instantaneously. Um, it can enhance your creativity by creating poems. We actually asked it to write a, a rap for us um, about instructional design and um, a, the life of an instructional designer. And it wrote us a rap. And then um, I actually, we did a little rap, just that was a just for fun kind of thing. Um, you can ask it to do sonnets. And again, here's back to the using it as a stu study aid. It can also help facilitate discussions by acting as a debate partner. And so you can actually have students play with this and have their own debate partner and they can debate with ChatGPT. Now, on the flip side of that, there are some limitations. It does lack some creativity. I had to feed it the information that I wanted it to do for the rap, um, but it didn't allow me, it didn't give me a beat and it didn't do all of the, and I teach music by the way. So that's why this discussion headed this way. So um, it also doesn't have empathy. Um, that's right now a good thing. So that would make it a little bit too human and a little bit too scary. So some other things that are limitations, privacy and security, cost, um, it can undermine academic integrity if it is not clearly outlined how it can be used and should. Now, the thing that we want to really emphasize today is students have been using something like this for a very long time. And then ChatGPT just kind of brought things to the forefront. Pandora's box is open and we're not going to shut it. So these tools that are coming out rapidly are just going to continue to come out. So what we need to do as faculty and instructional designers is think about how we want to incorporate these things because we know students are going to use them and make them appropriate um, for, for their use. And one of those things is also educating students about ChatGPT and how it can hallucinate um, and understanding that they need to check, fact check what they're getting. If they're putting information into chat GPT, they need to make sure that it's really giving them back information that is real. Um, I know I heard of a, a, a lawyer using chat GPT to do all kinds of things and he asked it to give court cases and whatever and chat GPT just hallucinated the court cases. They weren't even real. Um, and then, of course, we talk about ethical concerns of intellectual property. And again, it requires guidance, which as uh, faculty and instructional designers, we need to be the ones who guide those discussions. And Heather, um, this one's, oh, this one's mine. So um, this is talking about the benefits specifically of ChatGPT. It can produce a large amount of content in minutes, if not seconds. Today, I uh, asked it to create a um, 
workout plan based on my age, um, the fact I wanted to lose weight and build muscle, and I asked it to act as a personal trainer, and it gave me a whole workout plan in 30 seconds, probably actually less than that, probably 10. Um, the things you can also do, you can do engagement, um, activities, role playing. I asked it to create a plot based on Star Wars and Lord of the Rings where Princess Leia falls in love with Aragorn. And it wrote me a beautiful uh, screenplay. So you can do, um, you can ask it to create rubrics based on information that you put in. You can also ask it to sift through uh, a lots of amounts of either data or papers and give you a summary. Um, and Heather used it yesterday to summarize all of the questions that were turned in and so that we had categories so we understood exactly what it is we wanted to try to cover today. All right, now I'm gonna turn it back over to Heather. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say with the content, really it's limitless and um, to understand how it works, we really need to start using the tools. Just go ahead, choose a tool. It could be Bing AI, it could be Chat um, GPT 3.5, Google Bard. Um, I kind of see these chat, um, these these models, uh, sort of like what Google used to be or Bing used to be, and that you preferred one over the other. And so then, you know, it's going to be one of these where it, it'll function a different way. Each one functions differently. And it's just a matter of using the actual tool. And we want to, we, we, with students, we want to bring them into the discussion. It, it, we're scrambling to try to figure out and they're using it. So, uh, you know, it's, a, we're all learning together. This is collaborative learning. Like we need to learn from our students and, and ask them, you know, don't wait until you're an until you think you're an expert at AI. I mean, it changes every day, right? So, but have a conversation. How are they using it? Uh, what do they think about it? Why are they using it? Right? Um, you know, you could even have them help you reconfigure an assignment using um, one of these chatbots. So, you know, we also want to help them navigate these AI tools, right? We want to help them navigate. We want to um, let them know, as Paige mentioned, that these tools, um, ChatGPT, they hallucinate. So they will make things up and it sounds extremely plausible. If you are not a subject matter expert, you can read something and think, oh my gosh, that's awesome. And you believe everything. Well, if you're a subject matter expert and you read it, um, you can point out and find the untruths in some of the information that it gives you. This is really a prime time to discuss with your students codes of conduct, plagiarism, what is plagiarism in general, right? Go back to the discussion. We've got a statement on plagiarism. Let's talk to our students about it and, and, and what academic dishonesty is all about, right? And that their submission of AI um, without citing um, is considered plagiarism. A lot of students don't know that. We think they might know that, um, but I. But uh, there are some studies out there which we have resources, so we'll, we have some um, places you can go to read. But um, you know, students don't know uh, about the plagiarism and chat. GPT uh, output. So there are APA and MLA do have citation guidelines and we have those in the resources. Um, and, you know, kind of treat AI writing like any other form of plagiarism. We need to, don't make it complicated. We, we need just to inform the students. You know, you can't just copy and paste um, uh, into an assignment. Um, and you really need to discuss with yourself <laughs> Um, what your view is on using the, these AI models out there and generated content in your course. Decide what kind of policy or guidelines that you're going to have. It could be that one assignment you say, yes, you know, all, by all means, um, you know, use the uh, chat GPT, we encourage it or no. So there, there's also some resources we'll, we'll share with you on different um, faculty who have shared their um, AI policies for their syllabus. So you should have some type of uh, statement in your syllabus and set some expectations. Um, you could even actually have students help you write something on this would be an idea. You really want to now 
build the relationships with your students it is a crucial time to start doing this, um, building the relationships. Um, and then uh, we suggest that you input your own materials in one of these models, you know, an assignment, um, a quiz, an essay, and see what it, see how it responds and see um, how it sounds to you. You'll see a pattern. Um, the same phrases used over and over and over again. Um, and then, you know, we, we should look at reevaluating our assessments. What is it that we're trying to assess? When can the technology help students be more thoughtful and creative? And then when does it substitute for creativity and thinking? We should look at higher order thinking skills in our assessments and analysis, synthesis, evaluations, use reflective exercises um, and make, you know, uh, we call them authentic assessments, make the assignments meaningful to the learner, um, help them make connections and then modularize your assignments so you can see work at every step along the process instead of having a giant summative evaluation um, at the end of your course. Um, add more formative assessments, which is like, I'm going back to modularize your assignments, but um, throughout your course, have little knowledge checks throughout the way um, and discuss you know, along it, and also with these AI models and different strategies and use cases, discuss with your colleagues um, how you're using it. Are they using it? Um, you know, there are different views, right, on using these models for um, educational purposes. So we need to be mindful of that. We need to be respectful. Um, try to keep an open mind and hear what others have to say. Um, uh, I mentioned sharing with your colleagues, um, perhaps creating learning communities um, on AI. And those learning communities could be faculty only or they could be faculty and students, which would be fantastic. Um, hold lunch and learns. Um, we disseminate a lot of information in our newsletters that we have. We have a weekly update and then we have a monthly newsletter um, that we send out. Um, you know, spring was, I think, faculty trying to scramble and trying to figure out what they were going to do. Even instructional designers, how are we going to help faculty incorporate or, or what, what is it? What's going on? Right. So now we're starting to see more use cases come up. Um, I follow a lot of people on Twitter. I follow a lot of, I never was a Twitter person, but I follow, I follow several people on Twitter. I follow several people on LinkedIn. We have some resources, as I mentioned, so we'll, we'll list out some, um, but there's just so much information that I, I try to um, find also different views on it so that I can see how other people feel about it because I'm just, I'm, I love it. Um, but there's not a lot, there's a, there are, there is the other side of it as well. So, um, you know, what AI strategies have you implemented if you have it all or plan to implement with yourself or your faculty? <laughs> None <laughs> like that. None yet. Yeah, I think summer is a big time. Um, all of us are just trying to read and go to a lot of webinars that we can on the topic. I've, I try to go to every single uh, webinar on AI and there's a theme you can probably, for those of you who are like me, who have been attending a lot of these webinars are seeing the same type of themes. I think the next step is gonna be um, in these webinars are going to be use cases and how, um, uh, you know, how faculty and instructional designers are actually um, incorporating um, uh, AI into the classroom and into assignments. 
Um, so lesson planning. Yeah. I mean, the, the tool for, for faculty and instructional designers is awesome because it can help you write an entire lesson plan. It can help you with Bloom's taxonomy and writing your learning objectives and aligning those learning objectives with your course outcomes and creating a rubric that um, will measure uh, your one of your discussions. If you want a discussion rubric, rubrics can um took me forever. <laughs> um, but it's a great tool to, to help you with a rubric. And I'm not talking, you know, it taught maybe a minute that it will tell you, give you a rubric. Um, and then you can edit from there. It's a great, great brainstorming um, tool. Yeah, lots writing case studies. Go ahead, Paige. Lots of great answers. And as you can see, um, the nice thing about Slido is it also kind of groups things up here at the top together. Oh, okay, yeah. You kind of see what, what people, um, some of the keywords that it's finding out. So um, let's go on. So talking about some challenges and ethical considerations. Um, thinking specifically, um, the challenges are, it, it is disrupting uh, traditional um, the way we teach and the way students are learning. Um, also, it is uneven access. Um, as you just saw in the responses from the previous slide, uh, there were a lot of nuns. Um, and then there were a lot of, I'm ready to use it and I'll be using it in the summer. So the uneven access and adoption is also a challenge. The also the sustainability and the scalability. So how how big is it going to be? It's huge. Um, and how long can it be sustained? That's to be determined. Um, but if, with the number of tools that are coming out and as the technology is increasing, um, it is bringing up some also some ethical considerations. So about privacy and security, about human oversight and decision making. And I'm sure everybody has, um, if you haven't, there have been articles recently about the founder of OpenAI actually went to Congress and Elon Musk has also spoken up about this, about some of the speed in which um, AI is increasing and the things that it is capable of doing. And the fact is, it's not going away. We can't put it back in the box. It, it's open. So um, we really have to think about hold, holding our students accountable, but being very transparent. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to bring up, um, and I'm not sure if everybody is familiar, but Turnitin, it seems to be used by a lot of institutions, as it is mine. And Turnitin has an AI detector that it turned on in April. Um, and one of the things that they're finding out is that it's giving higher than expected false positives. So if you're looking at the Turnitin report, you are finding that it may come back at 100%, but there's a problem with that. I have, um, I have a, this is a real example of a student who had been using ChatGPT um, through the entire course from January to May. And April, she turned her paper in and because Turnitin, Turnitin's AI detector was on, it came back as 100% AI. However, it was her work. What she used ChatGPT for was to correct her grammar and her spelling. And the instructor gave her a zero and she ended up uh, having, she ended up failing the course and had to file a grievance because she was able to produce her original copy and then show how she put it into ChatGPT to use for the purpose of um, fixing her grammar and her spelling, which is a perfectly legit excuse. And, you know, there was no syllabus statement that said she could not use an AI. And it just happened to be that when Turnitin turn came on and it came back at 100%, the instructor didn't check it. And then the statement that you see on the screen is Turnitin's own disclaimer about using AI. And it should not be used for the sole basis for adverse reactions against a student. And that is their own disclaimer. So I did want to bring that up. Age. Yeah, you need to go forward on the slide. Oh, there we go. Thank there. you. Yep. Um, and we have a. I have also put the article in um, as talking about the uh, false positives from higher ed. Okay, so moving on. Now, some here are some recent case studies or examples of how AI is being used at three different, very large universities. 
um, and it is helping with financial aid, course planning. Um, all of these things are being used now. This is not in the future. These are AI that are being used and Georgia State's using it to um, personalize things so that they can boost their graduation rates and retention among at-risk at risk students, as well as AI is used, being used in grading. If you use Cengage, if you use Macmillan, if you use Pearson, and you have anything that is automatically graded, that is an AI. So we're already using AI that we just didn't call AI until um, ChatGPT showed up on the scene. And now it's being found in everything. So using these tools, such as Turnitin, which is also an AI. So you're asking Turnitin, which is an AI, to give you feedback on another AI. So you're asking an AI to examine another AI. So you can see there, there's a little uh, fault in the logic. So when you're using those kinds of things, it's you need to keep that in mind. And the other thing is, is Turnitin will also basically tell you that you can you can plagiarize yourself. So you have to be very careful with those kinds of tools. And um, Heather, it's back to you. OK, so the next big thing, you know, we've been talking about um, these models, um, but the next big thing is. Uh, Microsoft and Google, they're, you know, they're fully embedded into schools across, across the world, right? And at the moment, there's still barriers um, to entry for a lot of these models that are out there. Um, you know, for example, like ChatGPT, you, when you register, you have to have a phone number. Um, but both Microsoft and Google are going to be embedding the AI into all of their tools. So Microsoft 365, uh, Google Docs, um, this will be a total game changer. It hasn't, it's in beta right now. Um, some people I follow on LinkedIn and Twitter are, have access to, so they talk about what's happening with these. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, so it's gonna be coming down the pipe probably in the fall. Um, I mean, it's already embedded in workforce. Microsoft Azure, I think, is Azure. I don't know how to say it. Um, and then there's going to be Microsoft Copilot. Um, um, you know, Google's going to roll out several new features later this year, including um, embedding AI, like I said, in their Google Docs um, and Gmail uh, that can instantly generate a draft. Um, Ethan Mollick, I don't know if any of you have heard of him. He's with the Wharton School, but he calls it the button. Um, he has access to Google Docs with the AI embedded. Um, and it's just a button that you push and it will automatically draft the entire message, whatever, whatever your prompt is. Um, also in the works um, with Google is AI generated images and audio and video for slide presentations. I think someone mentioned something in the chat. Um, and then it's um, also going to have automatic formula generation for sheets. Um, and then there's speculation of chat GPT-5 coming down the pike not too long from now, um, closer to what they call artificial general intelligence, mm -hmm. hypothetical level of intelligence where a machine can perform any intellectual task that a human can. More capabilities such as multimodal input and output, multilingual support, better accuracy based off all the three, 3.5 and four GPTs and um, better reliability and more ethical and responsible use. So those are the big ticket items um, that are coming down the road. Paige. Thank you. So some more future developments. Um, and if you watched the news yesterday, um, these one in the middle virtual augmented reality came out. Um, Apple just released their $3,500 uh, VR headset. So um, it's here. And so those VR AR headsets um, can simulate uh, interactive learning and in an online environment. 
that would be a great tool to have. Um, again, but at the cost that it currently is, that is very prohibitive for a lot of students. So somehow or another, um, we could use that virtual reality to do simulated labs or simulated workforce um, things without having to buy the equipment or have people go somewhere and they could do it from home and start earning um, certificates and, and degrees by doing actual lab work with these AR and VR headsets. Again, we're adaptive learning. Uh, again, if you use uh, any kind of, uh, if you're in Canvas and you do talk about learning mastery, um, it's that is learning mastery on steroids and it is really individualizing the support that is needed and the feedback to the learners based on what they're turning in. And then of course, there's the other end of the spectrum, which is taking all of that information and analyzing it and having all these things put together and making sense out of the data that you're receiving so that you can make better choices and better decisions based on that. So implications. Um, so this is where, where, what is this really doing? So we need to really think about, um, think about our role as an instructional designer and as my role as a faculty member. How am I going to use AI myself and how am I going to get my students to use AI and how does that change my role? And what is it um, thinking about is, businesses and um, the outside world is using it. They want our students to come out knowing how to use it. They don't want students who have not had any experience using an AI. They want them to understand that it does give false positive. It does hallucinate. And they need to know how to write those prompts. And prompt writing is an art. If you haven't tried writing prompts to get the, it's think back when Google started, when you had to be very specific and you had to use quotes and pluses and um parentheses in order to get all of the information. And now you just type a question into Google and it comes back exactly what you want. Again, learning how to prompt write for any of these AIs is critical and teaching our students how to do that and using that as a way to get our students to talk about it and how they're using it and how they should be using it and what it gives them. And then the other thing um, is emphasis on this, on the DEI portion. Um, what is the information it's getting back? Is it appropriate? And if it's not, then it's a discussion that you need to have. You know, these are all ways that you can incorporate AI into your class and have your students use it in a way that is beneficial to them and to you. Um, and so these are some of the things that we have tried to cover. And now we're going to head into the resources and yes. our conclusion. So I'm going to turn it back over to Heather. All right. So next slide. Uh, so I've got a Padlet that I created. I created it back in, the, in November when uh, everything started just flying. And so here's the QR code. Um, there on this Padlet is a, um, there's a bell shaped over on the right hand side and you can follow this Padlet. So I update it daily with information. I try to put a date on there if I can. Um, some are just, uh, resource hubs that belong to colleges and universities across the state. Um, so, and I added a new column for student perspectives. So I'm starting to put articles in there on student perspective side of things. Okay. The next Padlet I have <laughs> is an open Padlet. So you can, um, I've started pulling together use cases. Um, it, it, you can uh, add to this Padlet. Um, it's moderated by me. So I'll just go in and improve it. But um, please add use cases that you run across. Um, there's writing courses and creating prompts and general strategies, STEM, um, language acquisition. So there are some use cases that are starting to pop up and start. we can all start generating some great resources in here. Um, the next slide, we talked about um, the tools that we use, and there are so many. 
right? So there are great Chrome extensions out there. I use chat, what's called use chat GPT, and it um, follows me around wherever I go. <laughs> and I can, um, I can have it change my writing, my tone. Um, it's really neat. Um, there's Grammarly Go is another Chrome extension. The different websites, we have Gamma AI, which is, which is a really cool presentation maker along with Beautiful. Um, some standalone tools. I don't know how many people have Canvas. Um, well, I shouldn't say just Canvas, but Harmonize is going to be integrating ChatGPT into their product. So it is an LTI. It, it plugs into your current LMS. Um, I'm not sure all of them, um, but I know for Canvas and Moodle it does. Um, and then some blogs and newsletters you can see, Superhuman, The Rundown, One Useful Thing, um, and a couple of others on there as well. So um, with Harmonize, they're going to, uh, what it's going to be helping you do is, um, we're going to, I'm going to be beta testing. Um, it's going to help you write your prompt and it's going to allow you to incorporate Bloom's taxonomy as along with objectives. And it's going to do all of that. And then it's going to help you write that prompt. And then you can um, finesse it or you can use it or you can ask it to redo it. So that's a tool that is really helpful. Um, and with um, getting those discussion prompts so that they are current and um, especially with Harmonize because in Harmonize, it's not straight text that you can ask. You can ask for students to make a video, use a GIF or all kinds of different uh, multimedia to respond to your discussion prompt. So 77% um, of the devices that we have currently feature AI. So 77%, that's a huge number. And we have one more interactive slide. What is the number of AI powered voice assistants that will be used this year? Yes, it is. <clears throat> Eight B billion. So that's Siri, that's Alexa, that's Google, all of those. And this statistic was the one that blew me out of the water. By 2024, there will be 8.4 billion voice assistants, which surpasses the total global population. <laughs> and we would like to end with ChatGPT has tremendous potential. And it is going, not going away. Um, so we are hoping that some things in here, whether it's our resources or our discussion, kind of piqued your interest and that you are going to go and you're going to go play with it so that you understand exactly what it is, what it does, how it can be used. You can use it for, you know, put your own prompt in, get answers back and be like, yeah, I can't be using that because that is exactly what I want. So thinking about how to redo um, assessments and activities so that students who are going to use it, when they use it, will be giving you more of their own authentic um, responses and using it as a tool just to help them craft things a little better. Hey, Paige, um, where did you get those numbers again? That was tech, tech, um, that eight I, 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 Yeah, hold on. I can, I can go find it. Someone asked, so I was just, I, I forgot. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, it was a, a, an article and I can, I have them somewhere in here and I'll put that in the, in the chat. Mm -hmm.